Welcome to the Center on Transition Innovations webcast called Moving Towards Independence for Individuals with Autism Spectrum Disorders. My name is Stacy Carr and I'm a developmental psychologist and I work at the VCU Autism Center for Excellence. Please take the next few minutes to read the case of Natalie. So when we talk today, we're going to be discussing inclusion. Inclusion with community participation, healthy choices, physical well-being, and independence. And through this webcast, when we're discussing these things, we're going to keep in mind Natalie and her support needs. I am thankful to all those who said no. Because of them, I did it myself. This is a quote from Albert Einstein, and I think it's very true. Um, when we think about um, Natalie. And one of the things that we see with her is that unfortunately she is very dependent on those around her, her teachers, her parents, because of her lack of communication, consistency, um, the lack of um, her ability to advocate for herself and her uh, inability to engage socially, academically, and um, and with hygiene and personal well-being activities. So we're going to be talking about how to achieve the greatest independence possible. So let's think about Natalie. She has more support needs, obviously, and what we need to think about are communication strategies. One of the things that we noticed is that she started with one communication strategy and when she transitioned to the next school year that communication system changed and if she was able to learn any of those skills initially if you're changing communication systems from year to year or even week to week or month to month she's not going to have a functional communication system as she ages. Natalie's now in eighth grade and still is unable to get her needs and, and um, wants met and so we really need to consider what communication strategy is going to be most successful for our students. And whatever that communication strategy is, we need to make sure it's consistent from year to year, teacher to teacher, environment to environment. So that when she's in the cafeteria, when she's in the hallway, when she's in the office, when she's at home, and when she's in the community, she's using the same communication system. For Natalie, she has a lot of anxiety issues, and so we want to really consider what are we going to do for her to be consistent? We want schedules and we want routines. We want to make sure that with those, um, those routines, if we make sure that they're consistent, she will start to learn those routines and will need less assistance and less support needs, therefore becoming more independent. And this is something that she needs to be practicing both at home and at school and actually in the community as well. We need to give her some ideas about coping strategies. She doesn't understand a lot of um, the adaptive skills that we've discussed in other webcasts, so we really need to think about what is going to work with her and her areas of need. And so developing those coping strategies for when she's stressed so that she doesn't engage in that self-injurious behavior that's so de detrimental. If we want to think long-term for Natalie, we want her to be successful and independent and and have a job and, and be an active member in the community. And with self-injurious behavior and her elopement behavior, she's going to have a difficult time meeting that need. So we really want to make sure that she has some strategies in place so that she is able to calm herself when, when it, or be cued to calm herself um, when needed. She has um, a lot of support needs around daily living skills. 
she's an eighth grade girl who has her menstrual cycle and she still needs support for that. So we want to make sure we're providing the, the teaching, the supports needed so that she can move towards independence with those intimate skills in, in the bathroom, um, at home, in bathing, in um, keeping herself healthy and clean. And for part community participation, I talked about the elopement behavior. And this is something that is going to be very tricky for her. If she's in a situation where she's not comfortable and she runs off, that's, that's a safety risk. And we want to keep Natalie as safe as possible. So with communication, we want to talk about three important things. It needs to be universal. That means that everyone should be able to understand the communication system. Whether she's at McDonald's ordering, where she's with uh, grandma and grandpa, she's with mom and dad, she's with peers, her brother or sister, or she's with her teachers, any teacher should be able to understand her communication. It needs to be functional. We want to teach her things that are most important for her. We don't need to teach her things that are not motivating or aren't um, things that she needs specifically um, to be an active member in her community. And it needs to be meaningful. So we want to make sure those things that are most reinforcing, that are most um, motivating for her, are, are part of that communication system. With all these three things combined, we can provide a very um, rich communication device system that will work for her. We talked about consistency. So here are some examples of visual supports and schedules for routines. The first one is about um, is a home routine, so getting ready for bed. And depending on an um, uh, individual's ability to read or understand picture cues, either of these are very useful so that they can identify what steps to, um, that comes next. And eventually, she will be able to do this independently. But if we don't have a consistent routine, and sometimes we take a bath, sometimes we take a shower, sometimes we eat dinner and then do that, sometimes we do that then eat dinner, that's going to be very difficult. So we really want to make sure that there's that consistent um, set of ground rules and routines for her. That said, sometimes we do have changes. So having a social narrative that will um, that you can practice with her so that she knows that if there's a change coming, that there are those coping strategies that hopefully we're teaching her that she can do to um, relax during those situations. So this one is, sometimes there are changes in my day. I don't like changes. Sometimes I feel mad or frustrated. Um, I don't want to listen to change. But changes happen sometimes, and I need to listen. It's not a big deal. I could say I'm frustrated by this change. I could take some deep breaths. I can... Um, squeeze a, a stress ball, I can go for a walk, whatever the coping strategy is, but identifying that you're, you understand that it's, it's stressful for her, but she needs to accommodate anyway. The final schedule here is um, a full day schedule from wake up to bedtime, and this incorporates um, kind of the main things like getting up, going to school, lunch, coming home from school, homework, um, routines uh, associated with home. So these are three different types of schedules that could be used. And of course you can make these anyway using um, Google Images, Board Maker, um, a variety of visual supports. For coping strategies, why do we need to have coping strategies? Well, we need them for social interaction, of course. If we are in a situation and it's a nice social gathering and we act in a way that is um, inappropriate or aggressive or injurious in any way, that's going to really uh, put a damper on the social interaction. We also need this for employment. If she's uh, working um, at a grocery store or at an office and she engages in any of these behaviors, the tolerance level of employers and um, fellow employees is going to be pretty low. So we really want to make sure that she learns these coping strategies. And of course they're also important in community involvement. And so here are a few examples of, of uh, coping strategies. The first one is um, when I feel, and the red are those um, hot emotions, so angry, worried, sad, anxious. 
So when she feels that, then she can use one of her tools. And the yellow are her, her tools. So this is counting to 10, squeezing, taking a deep breath, laying down, um, having a cup of water, whatever. Um, then you will feel calm, relaxed, happy, whatever. So we're really working on identifying when these emotions are happening, what are the strategies, and what's the outcome going to be. The next one is just a, a visual cue to think about something that makes you happy. Um, sometimes we'll have um, individuals have pictures of their family or their pet or a drawing that they really like or a picture of the beach so that that's a cue that uh, that's something that makes me feel calm. You know, when you're stressed at work, you might look at your screensaver and it's a picture of the Bahamas and that might make you feel calm. Um, so identifying those sorts of visual cues that would be helpful. The next uh, set of six pictures is a relaxation procedure. And this is a way of identifying when you're feeling stressed and anxious, it's a way of relaxing your body so you feel that tense and then you learn to relax and what relax looks like. And doctors June and Jerry Groden out of the Groden Center in Rhode Island developed this strategy um, in using um, relaxations um, paired with cognitive picture rehearsal imagery um, to reduce some of those anxious, um, stress-evoking um, feelings. And they've used it with young children through adulthood, and it's been very, very successful. The um, final thing is when I'm frustrated, angry, or accept, these are the things I can do. These are these checklists of, of acceptable ways of dealing with those situations. So ask for a break, go for a walk, count, um, do a vigorous activity, um, ask for help. That's something that sometimes having the ability to use your communication system and ask for help or a break and having someone engage you in a way of learning how to calm down. And that's perfectly acceptable too. Daily living skills. So these are things, you know, we, she needs to be successful with in order to be independent, both for school, for work, for community, for social. And if she wants to um, move towards uh, having less dependence on her family, these are things that she's going to need to do. And this is also to reduce the stress of family members as well. You want to be able to have your son or daughter do these things on their own. And so things like bathing. And sometimes um, individuals have a hard time knowing how much soap to use. So you know, I, I recommend using a pump and using one pump in like a loofah sponge and it, get, it kind of suds up nicely. And that sponge sometimes is a nice way of um, sensory-wise to, to bathe your whole body and knowing um, kind of a routine when you're in the shower as well. So you do your arms and then your, your body and then your legs and then your face, whatever the, the, the system is, but having that same sort of routine every time. Um, Caring for your menstrual cycle, there's a visual support in here. It's very small, and if you email me, um, I will send you a larger version of that. But um, I recommend starting this well before your menstrual cycle starts and making sure that they know the, the process and it becomes part of their bathroom routine prior to having any um, of those initial menstrual cycles. The other thing to, that goes along with... with um, the menstrual cycle is mood changes, so you can start looking for that, tracking that on a calendar. And obviously there's a lot of discomfort sometimes, and so knowing that when there's discomfort that um, your, your daughter will need Tylenol or um, some sort of medicine to relieve some of that, that as well. Um, deodorant, making sure that they're putting on deodorant, and if they're in PE, that they're applying after PE. Um, if it's hot outside, you're reapplying because it wears off midday. And, um, you know, doing three swipes per armpit or if you're using a can, two spritzes, some sort of very structured way of knowing that that activity has, has been accomplished. And with Natalie, she really likes that repetitiveness. So if you have the same thing, like three um, strokes with deodorant every armpit, and that's what she does every day, that's gonna be part of her routine and she's gonna be comfortable with it. Medi medication management, um, this is a, um, 
something that's important um, for Natalie. She's on some anxiety medication, so having her um, go and get her own medication based on the day and prompting her to do so instead of you giving it to her or her going, um, maybe she has to take medicine at school. So having some sort of um, cue, whether it's a, a tone on her phone or um, a visual reminder that she needs to go to the nurse instead of you saying, Natalie, it's time for you to go to the nurse. So that she's starting to take ownership of that. Um, teeth brushing. Sometimes kids, all kids want to brush their teeth really quick and they don't brush all their teeth. So playing a song while she's brushing her teeth and when the song's over, she's done. Or having, um, there's toothbrushes that make music that she can use. Or having, again, a specific routine, 10 on each side, top and bottom, front and back. So that, it, again, part of the routine, she's comfortable with it and she's more successful that way. For community participation, we want to make sure that she is, we're choosing the right activities for her. Um, what are her interests? What does she like to do? If she has specific interests and hobbies, those are the things we need to capitalize on. If she has these behaviors of elopement, we're not going to take her to a place that she's not going to like because she's going to want to leave. So identifying what public and private facilities are out there that would be very um, reinforcing and motivating to her. So looking at pools and parks and, and fitness centers and YMCAs, looking at different trips and outings that would capitalize on those things that she really enjoys. If she likes music, going to events that have music. Um, but having making sure that her communication system is with her so that she can say no if she doesn't want to be there anymore. And accepting that and building up tolerance to different activities. And the other option is letting her go to a variety of different things and finding out what she enjoys and looking for those reassuring signs that she wants to say or she's having a good time or um, she doesn't want to leave and, and using those community participation opportunities in the future. With the community, we also need to be safe in the community. So knowing what those rules are. And for Natalie, she's going to need to be able to go to the bathroom hopefully independently. And what does that look like for her? That she perhaps goes to the stall, learns to lock the door. Um, sometimes our folks with autism will go into the bathroom and forget to do that and not remember to lock the stall. Um, making sure she's, she's um, washing her hands after she goes to the bathroom. Or sending her in with a checklist that she needs for um, being successful in the bathroom. We also want to make sure that she's um, knowing the, what the public rules are for appropriate behavior in the restaurant. It's not okay to sit with your feet up on the, on the table in a restaurant. It's not okay to um, eat with your fingers. Um, you need to use your napkin if you have pasta sauce all over your face. And knowing those skills and knowing those um, specific rules based on your environment. You can take those visual supports with you. If you're in a restaurant and she has... Uh, has a difficulty rem remembering to put her fork down or to use her napkin, bring a little um, visual reminder for her so that she knows there's a picture of a napkin and she needs to use it after every bite or whatever, or that she um, uh, needs to put her fork down so that she's not shoveling food. What is her behavior when she goes to different um, events like a sporting event or her brother's hockey game or um, if she's in the movie theater, how is she supposed to behave? And setting these expectations up ahead of time really is going to reduce the likelihood of inappropriate behaviors to happen. And you may have to start off slow so you're only attending an activity for a short period of time, but then you're building time and endurance um, for, for those activities. And then what happens if she needs help? Who does she run, who does she turn to? Hopefully she doesn't run to anybody, but who does she turn to? And who are you going to ask for help? And knowing that these community, um, community employees are going to help her. And so we look at police, fire, security, and those first responders as being the people that are um, with uniforms and are the helpful people. So we need to teach that firefighters, police, um, law enforcement, 
Um, any of those individuals who are wearing a uniform are community helpers. They're, they're here to help us. Here's what you do when you see them. And so that's something that can be taught at home or in the classroom. And when you're out in the community, identifying those people in the community. Oh, there's a firefighter. Firefighters are here to help you. And even uh, having some non-stressful interactions with them so that you're going up to them when they're um, out in a, re in a restaurant or out um, doing their shopping or um, going to a fire station so that there's a comfort level with first responders. Teaching um, Natalie to be calm and to disclose. Now, Natalie doesn't have a lot of language, and so she's going to need that consistent communication system so that she can can get her her needs met by telling someone, I need help, I'm lost, I'm whatever, um, and that that first responder is going to be able to understand. So making sure that, back to the communication, that what she has is useful and universal for everybody so that they know how to interact with her. And having her with an identification card. Um, you can get an identification card without getting a license and making sure that she knows that when you ask her her name, she pulls out her identification card. Or even it's something that says, my name is Natalie, I have autism, I need help, or mom's phone number or something, so that she has a tool for um, interacting with individuals, especially if she's in need of help. And so this is a skill that you could teach at school. You can teach her that whenever anyone asks her her name, if she doesn't have her communication device, which she should, but if she doesn't, she pulls out her identification card. And then the, the person receiving it says, oh, Natalie, do you need help? Or are you okay? Or something like that. And that can help her um, initiate the next part where she has to say, I, I, don't, ha I don't understand, or I need help, or find my mom, or what have you. Paula Kluth has said, the more you try to control a situation, the less control you'll have. And this is obviously true for, for most people, but for Natalie too. So if, if she's in a situation where she's eloping and she's running off, if you try to run after her and gather her and not and use too many words or put your hands on her, the situation may escalate to self-injurious behavior or aggression. So knowing how to interact with people with autism is very important, and especially for someone like Natalie who doesn't have that communication that is, is easy to understand all the time. You can reach me anytime for any um, additional information, any visual supports that I have shown, or um, any strategies I've suggested, please feel free to email me and I will send those to you anytime. Next you're going to hear from law enforcement and a parent perspective on working with individuals on autism, with autism on being active members in their community and being healthy and safe. Thank you. Hello, I'm Tim Sutton. I'm a uh, law enforcement officer here in the state of Virginia. And we're going to cover some issues on autism. Uh, and the topic is prompting personal health and independence and community participation and safety for individuals with ASD. And this is kind of a law enforcement uh, perspective of, of what we're going to present here. We're going to talk about Natalie. She's a 14-year-old middle school student and a self-contained class. And there's support needs there. She does have higher support needs. She uh, has aid and uh, is in special classes uh, to basically give her her education. There is no reliable communication uh, for Natalie. There have been issues of uh, pet cards and, and different ways of communicating, but there is no specific uh, reliable way that she uses that now. Some sign language, and it appears that only one teacher knows what her wants are. So that's going to be an issue should that teacher not be there. There need to be more people involved uh, in this process. General anxiety disorder she's dealing with, and you think about the confusion, the mass confusion in schools where they're changing classes and things, where Natalie has an issue when, when she's taken out there in the hall with all the other kids. Uh, so some considerations need to be taken into account there. She's self-injurious, which I've got a star beside that which, uh, you know, I, I've run across many children with uh, autism who are self-injurious, who have 
uh, sensitivity issues, and once they start, their coping mechanism is hitting their head against the wall, biting themselves, hitting themselves. So for a law enforcement officer, you know, it's one thing to come over and find a four, five, six-year-old who has bruises, but once you start seeing them get older and then the parents have bruises, we respond to a call that's maybe unrelated to anything. Maybe it's a vandalism. We start seeing a child that has bruises and bite marks. Um, you know, that kind of piques our curiosity. We get, we get paid to be curious and go out there and find crime and solve crime. So when we see things like that, sometimes the uh, little light bulb goes off and you start to wonder, okay, is there abuse going on? Is this something I need to investigate? Is this something I need to call social services about? Uh, so we need to understand autism and that some of these things, uh, for some people, are common with autism. But officers need to be able to understand that as well and recognize that, especially the school resource officer or their DARE officer might be in the school. If they're familiar or they see Natalie and all of a sudden pick up on these bruises and marks, it may cause them to get a little curious and, and want to dig a little deeper and find out, okay, is there abuse? So, uh, so the, these are some issues that uh, need to be addressed. She prefers repetition and routine, which uh, is typical for autism, um, but it's also information that the officers and anybody who comes in contact with her or works with her needs to be aware of. Uh, she will usually have somebody with her, and from what I've read in her study is even in the future years, she will probably be in a situation where she will have somebody with her at most times uh, to help her along in life. Uh, she takes pride in job well done. You know, uh, the thing about autism is when we're speaking to them in a law enforcement capacity, we're not getting that eye contact or things that they don't appear to be paying, paying attention to us. Officers need to realize they are paying attention to you. They hear what you're saying. They know what you're saying, but they're trying to process what's going on. Uh, so the, the taking pride in her job well done, when she's told she did a good job and, and that's passed on to her, she understands that. Uh, she may not express it like we would, but she, she, she'll have her own little way of expressing that. She requires helps with, help with li life skills, and like I said, that will probably continue on for many years. And there's a sleep issue. Um, not a lot of sleep there, which is an indicator to me where the parents are involved. There's probably not a lot of sleep for the parents. Uh, wandering is an issue and uh, getting out of the house, taking off, that's an issue for many parents, and many parents are up most of the night that I've dealt with trying to ensure that their child doesn't leave the house, get out of the house, uh, and take off, wander, elope, uh, where law enforcement has to get involved and come out and search for them. So they, there's some support issue, uh, support needs issues. Like I said, she will probably need the support system throughout, uh, throughout her life or in, into the future. And I'd like to share with you some unfortunate statistics that uh, are maybe disturbing. They're a little bit old. Uh, unfortunately, with the age of them, uh, I, I would, I hate to say it, but probably today this, the numbers are a little bit higher. An individual with a disability is 33% more likely to encounter violent crime than the general population. That's from the uh, National Crime Victim Survey. The next is 49% of people with developmental disabilities who are victims of sexual violence will experience 10 or more abusive incidents. And 83% of developmentally disabled females and 32% of males are victim of sexual assault. That's why we need to take a proactive approach. And anybody that's watching this, I, I commend you for taking it upon yourself to get this information. This information needs to be out there. The law enforcement, uh, there is training available, and we need to educate as many people as possible. So why the victim? Why, why or how could Natalie become a victim? Uh, first of all, she may be to the point where she's not really able to defend herself. Uh, if something were to happen or she were approached by somebody or put in a very awkward or threatening situation, she might not be able to defend herself. Um, uh, hopefully that aid or whoever her support system is or whatever parts of that are available are there to help keep her safe. She may be lured into activity that she doesn't know any better. She doesn't realize that she shouldn't be doing this or shouldn't be doing that. Um, that's part of the uh, part of the support system needs to be there to help teach her what what's right, what's wrong. 
um, but she might not know better, therefore she could become a victim. I think that's why a lot of the, no the numbers we saw on those previous slides are there, because they're victims that don't realize they're being victimized. Depending on where she is on the spectrum, you know, people with autism want the same things that everybody else wants. They want friends. They want to be liked. And if anybody's giving them attention, whether it's good attention, bad attention, they might not be able to differentiate uh, between the two, but they may consider that person an actual friend. Um, just that attention that they're giving is, you know, I've seen, I see other people interacting or talking, and now I'm getting attention, so this person must be my friend, I trust them, uh, and, and they don't consider what could possibly happen. May not be able to articulate the abuse, should something happen. You know, right now Natalie does not have a, an effective communications um, means of communications. She's used pet cars, different things, but I think it's, it's important to uh, develop a way for her to communicate, stick with that, so she could become more proficient with that should, should he, she need to communicate something. But she may not have a way to articulate, or if she did try to articulate, she may not be able to articulate where, to, to the point where somebody would understand what's actually going on. So that, that needs to be um, addressed. One thing that I try to um, you know, stress to everybody, and it doesn't just go to, for autism, but everybody has something to say. I don't care if you're sitting in a classroom with your arms crossed or laid back in a chair, you're, you're speaking something. Uh, it's nonverbal, but you're, you're speaking in everything, in every, um, everything you say and everything you do. People with autism have something to say. Just because they can't voice their opinion or vo uh, say it through their mouth, they've still got something to say. We need to determine what their way of saying things is. It may be pet cards, it may be sign language, it may be typing. They might not be able to speak a word to you, but if you set them in front of a computer, they could probably tell you everything they did that day. So we need to find out what their effective means of communication is and, and really focus on that and practice on that. So should they run across situations where they do need help or they become victimized, they have a way to communicate uh, that to their teachers, to law enforcement, or to their parents, anybody. Now, introducing law enforcement, I would think that there is either a school resource officer or a DARE officer or somebody at that school or somebody who frequents that school who's in uniform. We need to acquaint that person with Natalie and all the other children in the school, especially ones with any special needs. Get them to see that officer, become accustomed to that uniform, realize that officer, that uniform, that keeps me safe. <clears throat> I had a situation, our agency uh, has a tracking system for wanderers and elopers. Uh, we had a young girl who's nonverbal who we would go out and see once a month to change the battery in their tracking device. I was off duty one day, I got a call from the mother. She was at an amusement park outside of where I work, about 30 minutes away, 30, 45 minutes away. She called and said, my daughter's gone. I said, well, you need to call that agency where you are they have the same tracking equipment. They can do the exact same job I can, but I'm on the way home to get my vehicle. I'm on the way to you. I'm coming down there. Well, by the time I got home, she called me back and said, we found her. And she said, you're not gonna believe this. And I said, well, how did you find her? Her daughter had walked around the amusement park until she saw a uniform. Once she saw the uniform, she walked up to that security officer, grabbed his shirt and just held on. Couldn't tell him anything, but he knew something was going on. That's how she got found. She knew that officer, she knew that uniform itself was there to keep her safe, so she walked until she found that uniform. So we need, um, we need to get, get law enforcement involved in, in, as part of this support system. Again, we need to find that effective means of communication and make it a routine. Uh, with autism, there's a want for routine, the same thing. Um, so we need, need to find out what the preference or what she does best as far as communicating and stick with that one, one uh, means. Make the officer routine to that environment. Again, like I said, it's imperative to get her familiar with that officer. Uh, I would recommend all school employees get training that they're aware of autism. They understand because there may come times when Natalie may wander out of the classroom and, and a teacher see, a, see uh, her walk by. They need to understand 
okay, well, yeah, I know Natalie, and I think I understand what's going on. Let's go redirect her, bring her back to where she's supposed to be. I would hate to think of Natalie getting out of her room and passing by all these other school employees who just watched her walk on down the, down the hall out the building, uh, not realizing that she uh, had autism and could easily wander off and get hurt. So we need, we need all the school employees trained. Involve law enforcement in that training. Law enforcement, some agencies do have training that they could incorporate with the uh, school system. Bus drivers, they're driving the children back and forth every day. They need to understand what's going on. Every member of the faculty needs to go on, get involved and, and understand autism. I don't think anybody at that school uh, would be excluded. I think each person needs that training. Right now in Virginia, there is training available um, through Department of Criminal Justice Services, um, Commonwealth Autism, and myself and a few other officers in the state we have been going around doing a uh, four-hour class on autism as well as a one-day train the trainer to train other officers in, in their agencies to train their uh, officers. Um, right now, autism training is not mandatory in the state of Virginia. Uh, my personal view is it should be. Uh, there are a few states out there where it is. We do have JP's Law. Um, and some may say, if you're not familiar with JP's Law, it, it's an opportunity for individuals on, on the autism spectrum or with other intellectual disabilities, developmental disabilities, to go to DMV voluntarily and have an ID given to them that on the back it says AD, ID, uh, as an indicator should they come in contact with law enforcement. Um, to get that ID, it doesn't matter how old, how old you are, it would not be bad to have something like that in Natalie's pocket so that if somebody does come across her, uh, they will see that. But that is out there, that is available uh, to anybody that's interested. And uh, the, the training, while Natalie is more of a, has more support needs, you know, the officers need to understand the self-injurious behavior. She may continue on with that throughout her life. And as she gets older, there may be more opportunities for officers to have encounters, have interactions with her, and they need to be trained. Unfortunately, you know, it's not mandatory in the state of Virginia that the officers have this training. Um, and sometimes these situations, the officers get there and they don't know anything about autism. And sometimes not by the fault of their own, they're not doing exactly what uh, could, be gone, um, could be done to resolve the situation. We need to get out there uh, and we need the parents and families to voice their opinion. Uh, most families I've met that deal with autism, the families are very vocal. They're on fire for any kind of training or anything to make people aware uh, of, of what's going on in their life. And, I, and just get out there and make people aware of the fact that they need autism training. And it's not just law enforcement, it's the whole criminal justice system. And I would push it even further to say that anybody out there who comes in contact with the general public needs it. I don't care if it's hospitals, airports, anywhere, mall security. Um, I've had the opportunity to train amusement park security, and I'll be doing that again shortly to understand what's going on with uh, autism. And I get a lot of feedback, and I, one particular amusement park I got feedback from the year after I first uh, did the training. They said they had six incidences that year uh, dealing with autism. And had they not gone through the training, they probably would not have handled the situation correct, situations correctly. So we need to get out there and train people. So get out there and, and, and make people aware that they need training, first of all. Secondly, let them know there is training available. Uh, if it's not law enforcement, I train more than just law enforcement. You're welcome to contact me at a better understanding. Uh, but please, uh, let's, let's get out there and, and I, I know my position has afforded me the opportunity to advocate for the families. So let's get out there all together and let's just educate people. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share what I have. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tammy Burns and um, I am a parent of three children. I have a 19 year old, a 17 year old and a 15 year old. Um, my 17 year old has autism. He was diagnosed with autism at 18 months um, and then we reconfirmed that diagnosis at age three. Uh, so I have been around the autism community here in Central Virginia for quite a while. 
And today I'm going to talk to you about um, personal health and independence and community participation and safety from a parent's perspective. And um, so let's get started. We decided um, long ago that our family wanted, one of the things we wanted for our son with autism was to be able to live as independently as possible. He's 17 now and we're still trying to figure out exactly um, what that looks like and what that means. Um, but we know for sure as we've gone through this process that it involves um, certain skills that he's gonna have to have um, to be able to live independently. And I've also learned that living independently may not mean um, living on his own. It may mean um, that he's still living with some supports and um, with some help, but it does mean that he is making choices about how he's living and what he's doing. And so we have been, again, we have been working for um, several years on teaching him how to make those kind of choices, choices based on safety, choices based on his preferences, choices based on what's healthy for him and his body, um, so that he can live as independently as possible and make those choices for himself. Um, he, you know, we want him to be able to make those choices, not just in where he's living and, and how he's living, but in what kind of job he might have, in what kind of activities he participates in on the weekends and um, afternoons, and just to be able to do, you know, make choices on his own, to have that dignity and that sense of pride as this is who I am and this is what I can do. Teaching your child, no matter how young or, or how old, independent living skills, it's important for not just their safety, but as I said, their quality of life. Because independence and how far, how much independence a person can have is a key to successful communi community participation as well as future employment. And for, for my son, we want him to have a job and to be able to have something to do after high school. And it's really important that he have some of those independent skills to be able to do that. So I'm gonna share with you today some things that we've done and some ways that you might be able to do this um, with your child as well. First, I would suggest it's really important to start early. Um, when Jared was little, you know, at one point, I remember finding myself thinking, well, he can't do this and he can't do that and he can't do this, um, and had to back up and kind of reevaluate what I was saying um, to know that even very young children can start helping with things like their dressing routine, cleaning up behind themselves, all of which le leads to all kinds of independent living skills. Now, as a mom, especially a mom with three kids, it's a lot of time, you know, a lot of times I find myself, it's easier if I just do it. It's easier, it's faster, it gets done the way it needs to be done. However, um, especially for my child with autism, it is important that I give them the opportunity, give him that opportunity to do it and learn from uh, what he's doing and to begin to increase his independent living skills. So, so when Jared was really little, even you know really little, um, I would bring him in the laundry room and I would take the clothes out of the washer and hand them to him and he would put them in the dryer. And that was his helping with the laundry. And we have grown that um, over the years, many, 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 many times working on um, different little skills in between to now he is able to put clothes in the washer, start the washer, get them out of the washer, put them in the dryer, start the dryer, get them out of the dryer. Um, not so great at folding yet. The folding looks like, a, you know, kind of a big pile of stuff, but we're getting there. And so folding and sorting is now our, our task at hand um, because at some point when he's able to say or able to, to in, demonstrate he can do his own laundry, that is a big skill. That is a very important independent life skill. He's not, you know, dependent upon anybody else anymore to wash his clothes. Um, so he's, he's getting there. And so, you know, just one of those things that we started very, very young. And, and another thing, you know, with the laundry is we had him put his own laundry away. When he was a little, little guy, we put pictures on his dresser drawers and a picture, you know, underwear picture, shorts picture, t-shirt picture, and that meant whatever was on that picture went in that drawer. Um, now, it didn't go in the drawer the way I would have put it in the drawer, but it went in the drawer. And now he puts his own laundry away and it's a lot neater um, and he doesn't have little pictures on his, on his dresser anymore. Um, and it's not an issue for him. And so those, just beginning early and starting on any kind of independent living skill, any kind of chore, any kind of dressing thing that they can do um, will make a huge difference later on. 
when you find a task that you want to teach your child, um, something, an independent skill, um, then oftentimes the child with autism specifically, um, you find that you have to break that task into smaller steps. So, um, for example, uh, you could see on the screen there, you know, a task of washing hands. It might not be as simple as saying, wash your hands. You might have to say, washing the hands means turning on the water, getting your hands wet, you know, every step. And then giving the child the opportunity to check off or cross off or whatever it might be on that list um, to build that skill. And um, we did that, we've done that kind of thing with Jared to now he doesn't need the checklist um, and he just kind of goes through the steps in his head and is able to complete the task. Um, I will say one of the hardest things we've done with that was shaving. Um, as you know, as a, a girl, I've never fortunately had to shave my face, um, but my son does. He needs to shave his face. And so I said to my husband, this is something you're going to have to help and do with. I, you know, I don't know exactly what to do with this. And our first thought was, well, we'll do an electric razor because that's less chance that he might cut himself and these kind of things. But um, we quickly learned that Jared enjoyed the vibration of the electric razor and he would hold it in one spot so long that he would actually irritate and cut his face. So we said, well, that's not going to work. Um, but for two years, we broke down the steps. Um, it took us a long time, but um, he, you know, we figured very quickly decided too that the shaving cream gave a very clear indication of where you have shaved and where you haven't. And so we were able to use that, and um, he now is able to do his own shaving routine all by himself. And uh, my husband still peeks in on him a little bit um, because sometimes he gets too um, into the shaving cream and the water and um, forgets that he has a task to finish. But he now um, can do that, and, and now our that particular task has moved to discussing um, how much aftershave you use and how much is too much because sometimes, um, you know, sometimes it's, he's, he's got, you know, a handful and uh, he smells really good, but um, you can't get too close because he's really strong of smell. So we, um, we just begin to, you know, take those things, whatever it might be, whatever task it could be, whether it's shaving, washing your hands, going to the bathroom, um, taking a shower, um, whatever it might be, taking those, breaking it into steps that your child can be successful with and then gradually um, letting them take over that process so that they can do that um, independently. I'll also say, if you're doing that, um, you're probably going to run into some behaviors. Because if a uh, particular task begins to get difficult, you can expect as a parent to start seeing some negative behaviors from your child in order to, for them to um, get out of having to do the task. And as a parent, again, it's one of those times where you start seeing these behaviors and it's already taking forever and it's making a mess or whatever it's doing. It's a lot easier sometimes just to say, forget it, I'll do it. Um, but we decided as a family, you know, we didn't want to, when we really looked at that, we didn't want to be giving my adult son a bath. We wanted him to be able to do that on his own. And especially if I'm not around anymore, I don't want some other person giving my adult son a bath. I want him to be able to take care of that part of his living by himself. And so remind yourself why you're doing the task that you're doing um, when you get to these behaviors and then stick with it. Don't let the behavior get them out of doing what it is that you're trying to do. If you find the task is actually too difficult, then break it up into smaller parts still so that they can be successful with some of the um, parts to that and you can then reinforce what they're doing and the positive parts of that. But don't give up, don't let the behavior cause you not to do it and just kind of keep pushing through because it is that important. Things that we found work for our son um, and work for a lot of individuals with autism, again the visual schedules, um, visual schedules have increased his independence level tremendously over lots of skills. Um, he, we went from having a huge visual schedule on our um, refrigerator that he had to go by and pull the things down and put them away to now he uses um, schedules on his iPod or iPhone. And um, a lot of, as I said, a lot of his schedules have been internalized now and he follows them, but he doesn't even have to go and look at them anymore. They're not written down. But visual schedules can help complete not just a task or a list of tasks, but maybe the steps in between. Work on household chores with your child. Um, those build great independent living skills. Um, 
platform, my son, we've seen things that he's done as a household chore now turning into possible job skills, cleaning floors, cleaning tables, making beds, um, doing laundry. All of those things that he can now do at home are translating into the community and he's beginning to work on those as job skills. So it's not just independent for himself, but it's making him more independent in the community. Again, make sure you teach community safety skills. Um, so important for individuals um, that have some type of disability is that they understand what the safety skills are in the community. Um, who do they go to when they need help? How do they cross the street? How do they do public transportation? You teach those skills, break it down like you would anything else, because teaching those things not only keeps them safe, but it is gonna make them more independent. And then don't forget hygiene and self-care. As I said, I didn't want to be giving my adult son a bath. I didn't want to have to put his deodorant on for him or shave his face. Um, I knew those things were more important than even teaching him how to tie his shoe. So I had to kind of prioritize things that I thought were more important for his life and his life quality in general um, and work on those first. But make a list. What is it that they need to do? Why, tell them why it's important that they wear deodorant and then put it as part of their schedule. Because wearing deodorant not only is good for them, but good for everybody around them, and it oftentimes is what has somebody not get a job, but keep a job. It's very difficult to keep a job in the community if your hygiene skills are not good. So don't forget um, those things as well. It's not easy to teach independent living skills to someone who requires a lot of task breaking down, a lot of reinforcement, and multiple, multiple attempts to try something. As I said, it took two years to teach my son to shave. Many, many times we were frustrated. He was frustrated um, with the progress or the lack thereof um, on many things we've done. But you're, and you're going to find yourself at that same place. But don't give up because of lack of progress one day. Um, keep trying. You have to remember to be patient with yourself, be patient with your child, and as you go and you see little little um, successes, to celebrate those little tiny successes. And as the years build on themselves, you will begin to see big successes out of those little steps. Thanks.